Welcome to Face Forward, the inspiring change podcast on all things internal communications, engagement, leadership, and change. I'm really excited to be here today with Mary Davis, the CEO of Special Olympics, sitting in her beautiful house overlooking the sea in Hoth, having a cup of tea and a biscuit. Um, which is how you should be spending the afternoons in the winter, a week away from Christmas, I think. Don't you agree? (laughs) Absolutely, Scott. And you're very welcome to the home. We're only moved in here in July, so it's still very, very new for us. And in fact, because I spend so much time in the US now in DC, I feel like I'm a visitor in my own house. So I'm glad to be back here for three weeks. It's the longest time I've ever spent here because we only moved in in July. So I'm looking forward to it. And uh, it's beautiful to have a sea view and I find that the sea is very calming Mm. even when it's a rough sea there's something about looking Mm. out at water that can be very calming and um, inspirational as well at the same time so it's lovely to be here and no two days are the same I can guarantee I looked out this morning and the sea was like flash beautiful crystal glass Yesterday, it was roaring, tempestuous. wild, tempestuous. Yeah. So, no, no two days the same. And that's, what I guess, what's interesting. And it's it, it's like watching a fire. There's something, you know, you, you, you feel like you're never alone when you're watching the sea roll in and out mm. or watching the flames uh, burn and the cinders. So it's kind of beguiling, kind nice of beguiling, very beguiling kind of yeah. nature to yeah, it. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to kick off just a really easy one, first of all, by getting you to tell me a little bit about your career and then ultimately today as a CEO of Special Olympics, what your what your role is. Okay, well, I started out um, when I left college. I'm a teacher, so I worked in St. Michael's House uh, in Ballymun initially and then travelled around. And St. Michael's House is a large organisation for people with an intellectual disability. So I travelled around most of their centres, the all-day centres, time um, coordinating the whole physical activity program and as a result of that I got involved in Special Olympics in the very early days in Mm. 1978 okay Uh, so I was definitely straight out of college practically uh, although I'd done a few subbing jobs before that in various different schools so I thought Special Olympics was a wonderful organization at that time for me and for a couple of others of us that had begun to work in the field, we had really no materials, no resources, uh, because there was really nothing written here about people with intellectual disability and physical activity or the importance of it, etc. So it was wonderful having an organisation like Special Olympics that suddenly had those resources available to us, and we learned an awful lot from Special Olympics through uh, through getting involved. And I just loved what I got involved in and uh, working with people with intellectual disabilities and working through the program of Special Olympics was very uplifting um, experience. And they're wonderfully happy, energetic people to be around, eager to learn, wanting to learn. Mm. Uh, unlike many other students that I had taught when I was sobbing around in a couple of schools. so. I was energised by the job and particularly by Special Olympics then. So stayed involved and I was volunteered for 10 years. Then I became the first National Director of Special Olympics Ireland. And from there, we would keep thinking of ways that we could uh, raise more awareness, raise consciousness, change attitudes. Uh, get more volunteers involved in Special Olympics, like how how could we do more and more and more? And we always felt if we did something big, we, the organisation would be better recognised. And mm. we were always benchmarking ourselves amongst organi- other organisations or not-for-profits that were at that stage uh, and trying to figure out how to get there. So we organised the European Games in 1985, we had 17 countries come over to Ireland. Some of them had never even experienced Special Olympics before. So it was a great introduction for them as well. And went on from there to take on the world and organise a World Games in 2003. 2003 yeah. yeah. And yeah. I was fortunate enough to be the CEO for those games. Worked with an incredible board, Dennis O'Brien, a group of people who 
we're just so knowledgeable and we're uh, true leaders in their own mm. uh, field. You know, there were people that I could see had unshakable uh, confidence and courage uh, to do things uh, and to be innovative. Mm. And I was, I was very lucky to see it from the other side of the coin because I, I of course, volunteered in the badminton venue for the World Games That's and helped to run the badminton venue. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I got to see, which is bizarrely around the corner from my house now, about 500 yards. Fantastic. Um, so when I look back that 14 years, and absolutely, yeah, you know, it, it, yeah. Was a, it was an absolutely amazing thing to be involved in that really got the country behind us. Isn't it funny now, yeah. when you, and you'll be the same as me when you drive down the country, That's and you right. still see the twinning, the twinning yeah. signs with the, with the towns in Ireland, with, with the countries that came to visit that year. Yeah, it's, isn't it amazing yeah. that they're still there? Like 17 years ago, it's Phenomenal. hard to believe it's 17 years mm. since those games, but it is. Mm. And that the, the, the memory still lives on in all those towns. But it's not just in the physical presence of the signs. Yeah. The memory lives in people's minds. Mm. And so many people after those games got involved uh, in a voluntary capacity mm. at local level. So much so now that Special Olympics Ireland has something like 24,000 volunteers wow. on, its, uh, on its database, which wow. is just phenomenal. For and all of size. those... Mm. Yeah, mm. all of mm. those actively involved in one way or another. Mm. And there is no doubt but Special Olympics has gone from strength to strength and is an incredibly well-respected, trusted mm. um, and developed organisation mm. now. And it, it was, that's really what we set out to do in 1978, you know, when we were struggling and when we didn't have very many resources, constantly bringing people together, thinking brainstorming how we can how we can do better yeah. and now we're, we're seeing the results of that and all of the people who worked in a, in a volunteer capacity to make that happen so it's great to be at this stage and to see that and then I moved on to work as managing director in Europe so got to bring what happened in Ireland and the experiences and what I learned to a larger audience throughout Europe and you know, as I visited countries like Moldova or Romania or Russia or Uzbekistan and Central Asia, and you see, you know, where there is still a lot of stigmatization in relation to intellectual disability, mm. uh, still a lot of institutionalization, uh, and that's a bit like what it was for us back in 1978. Yeah. So we saw how we transitioned and moved forward. Now, obviously, in the work we're doing now, we're trying to do that an awful lot faster. We don't want it to take 30, 40 years for this change mm. to happen. So we are using experiences of the past to guide yeah. us for the future. And I think attitudes have changed as well, worldwide. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think in many ways, I don't think we're as, I don't think we're as old school as we maybe were 35 or 40 years ago. I think people's attitudes have changed slightly, unless you, I guess you'll have pockets yeah. where, it's, it's, where it's still the same. Um, you will. And now, of course, you're in a role as CEO of Special Olympics, Special Olympics worldwide, mm -hmm. to be able to bring that that European knowledge to a to an even higher level. Yeah, um, which is on the world stage. Yeah, which is great to be able to do that, and now to be able to see you know massive big countries like India and China and how they're progressing and how attitudes are changing there as well. I mean, it is great to be part of that and to be able to to be able to guide that with the volunteers in those programs. Mm. And Special Olympics itself has come a long way in that time as well, because when I started out in 1978, you know, it was very much an organization for people with intellectual disability, and that's what we did. We yeah. provided a service for people with intellectual disability, mainly through the platform of sport. Now that's still our strength, and we still work through the platform of sport, we have so many other programs that we've introduced uh, now. We have the, the largest health program for people with intellectual disability in the world. Wow. And there's so many disparities in health mm. for people with intellectual disability. Like that's, that's a big part of what we do now. Uh, we have a great, uh, what we call unified sports program, which is people with and without intellectual disability playing together in the same mm -hmm. playing field. And we feel that if we can introduce that program at the youngest age possible, in fact, from age two, we have a young athlete program mm -hmm. that's unified also. And where young children and school going uh, children, youth can interact, can learn from each other, 
whether you have a disability or not a disability, that you recognise that we're all the same at the end of the day, people. and that there really is no and no difference. Mm. And you know, people with intellectual disability can play sport just as well as anybody else, mm. and you don't even notice the difference when you see them on the soccer pitch or in the basketball court. So our program really has changed from being an organisation for people with intellectual disability to an organisation with people with intellectual disability and very much driven by people with intellectual disability. Mm. We have an incredible leadership program that we've introduced now as well uh, through our organisational excellence division. and. That's again a unified program where our athletes and our staff and some volunteers participate in that program with some board members who've participated as well mm. as um, in the Leadership Academy. We've run Leadership Academies all over the world and they have really helped our athletes as well uh, to be leaders in the organisation. Mm. So we're empowering them all the time. Mm. So it's not so much an organisation for now, like it was when I started, but an organisation from which we learn a great deal about life and about change and uh, about difference mm. and understanding difference from people with intellectual mm. disability. So okay. I say it's more of an organisation now from which we learn mm. rather than an organisation particularly for people with intellectual mm. disability. And that's the big change I've seen. And that's what's going to drive us forward. I mean, we're 50 years next year, especially because we started in 1968. And, you know, whilst next year is, of course, about looking back and celebrating the past, it's about how that past is going to drive us into the future and how we can bring that message of our athletes are not to be pitied, you know, neither are they to be forgotten. Absolutely. They are human beings. Mm. They have rights exactly the same as everybody else. And please treat them in that way and give them the support network that they need in order to shine and be the best that they can be. And that's all they ask for. And after all, that's all any of us ask for. Absolutely. We want to be the best that we can possibly be. I remember around the World Games time, there was a there was a bus shelter just really stuck with me, kind of fourteen or fifteen years on, and it was it was a picture of one of the Special Olympics athletes, one of the golfers, and he was a scratch golfer, That's and right. and it just said, where do, where do you see the disability? Yes, yes. And it was such a poignant such a poignant yeah. message that actually when he's got his, his 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 golf visor on, when he's on a green looking at his ball about to putt, you know, and he's a scratch golfer, which many, many of us aspire to be. Yeah, um, absolutely, you know, we and, sure do. And, he's and we'll <laughs> never be as good as that, as that <laughs> no, golfer, because I know him actually, his name's <laughs> Oliver Doherty. And um, he, were, when he was young, Oliver was bullied very badly uh, in school, had a really tough time, and his dad got him involved in golf, and he pursued it, as you say, to such an extent that uh, he excelled and won many gold medals at, at various different war games that he was at. And you know what? He came back to his community then in Donegal, because that's where Oliver's from. And he was made, he was invited to be captain of the club. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? Which, such a change from such an achievement. a child, uh, such huge achievement, absolutely, but such a change in attitude from you know, a society whereby he was bullied earlier on yeah. in his life to now a society where he was totally respected yeah. and uh, and acknowledged for his abilities, which is what he has. Interesting. So, very yeah. interesting. Listen, I'm going to go back a wee bit because you, talk, you, you touched very, very briefly there on the Leadership Academy mm. and the, the way that the, the Special Olympics looks now at more unified leadership. Um, and just from your perspective, what do you believe makes a good leader? What makes a great leader? maybe in Special Olympics or, or more broadly, if there's, a, if there's even a difference, I don't, I don't know. Mm. I, don't think there's a, I don't think there's a difference. And I, for me, leadership is very simple as well. I don't see, you know, I know there's loads of theories and loads of definitions of leadership and tons and tons of books and materials read about leadership. To me, it's about the way you behave. It's about your actions and it's about what comes from inside. And I think if you can inspire people by what you do, by what you say, uh, and if you can empower them, well then I really think that 
you're a true leader and it's authentic leadership as well it's not just leadership because I'm a CEO and I, neither do I think leadership is about being a CEO and I often say this to my own team you are all leaders mm. you're all the face of our organization mm. it's no matter where you work when you step out and represent Special Olympics or represent the company or the agency or wherever you work you are the leader, you are the front of that organization at that particular time. And you either impress people or you turn them off or you engage them. So it's about how we behave. It's about our attitude to things. You know, they say life is what happens to you 90% or 10% and how you react to it 90%. Mm. And it is because it's, it's how we react to different situations, to different things in our life. Mm. And you can react in a negative way or you can react in a positive way. Mm. And I, well, I would very much be somebody who would certainly try to react in a very positive way and would try to lead by what I believe myself and to show that every day. Like leadership isn't either, I think, just about, you know, sort of being something once every so often and doing something that you say, oh, you know, that's 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 my leadership bit box ticked. It's not like that. To me, it's every I've done my day. Leadership. I've done my, yeah, leadership, I've done my leadership bit for today, you know. It's not about that, you know. It's, it's about living every day with people, uh, showing them, empowering them, uh, Spending time with people as well, I think that's really, really important trait of, of leadership. And that you're actually spending the time with them. It could only be a couple of minutes, mm. but you're giving, you're feeling, making that person feel that it's, that it's their time with you mm. and that you're not distracted. Mm. And, you know, I always think sometimes when we're in company or when you're at a party and everybody wants to talk and nobody's listening to anybody mm. and mm. you begin to tell your story and suddenly you, you, you realise, you know, eyes are all over the room, nobody's listening to you, you think, oh, well, you're deflated then because you think, oh, my good story and nobody's listening to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I always feel that's, that's a bit about leadership as well, yeah. you know, that with staff particularly, staff like to be heard. They like their views to be, they like their views to be heard. Now they like they also like their views to be taken on board. And in as much as you can, I think you should try to accommodate that. But I don't think you always can. And I think if you don't, then you tell them exactly. we can't, and you tell them why. And you tell them why, but you've actually engaged with them right yeah. through the process, yeah. so they feel like okay, I've been listened to. That person really gets what I'm trying to do. Now, they've decided not to go down that route, but these are their reasons. And and then, that obviously, everybody's willing then to play on the team, yeah. just because it's a decision that they don't like. But it's how you come to that decision that's important, and that can either turn somebody off and put them off ever coming to you again because they feel they're not being heard. So I think being listened to and... Uh, Obviously, there's all the, 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 the words that we all talk about around leadership as well, like re respect and uh, trust. These are all important things. I think particularly respect and uh, trust in people. You're, I feel I have to trust my team, but I feel they've got to trust me as well. And it's building that uh, trust. And that can take time. It can yeah. take a long time. I love the way when you talk about you know, it, leadership not being a, you know, I've done my leadership today, tick, mm. I'm done with being a leader. Um, because I, I fundamentally believe that leadership is about being and not doing. It's not actually about mm. doing something. It's about like engagement. We spent a lot of time in a previous company I worked in talking to leaders about engagement and it all focused very much then on the engagement survey mm -hmm. and the employee survey. And, and I, I kept saying to them, it, it's that, all that is, is an excuse and a reason to have a conversation with people. It's a line in the sand. That's all. Get over yeah. yourself. All it's going to tell you is, are you being a good leader or not? And actually, many times when you look at some of these engagement surveys, the questions in themselves are just fundamentally basic leadership skills, really. Yeah. Um, you know, am I recognising my staff? Do yeah, they know exactly. the role they play? Yeah. Am um, I communicating? Because communication <laughs> is one 
it, th that to me is one of the great traits of leadership and it's it's not easy Look, and I don't know in the world if anybody has cracked it truly within a company or an organization because no matter where you go you'll hear you know there's been a breakdown in communication or such a one thought they communicated with me but they actually hadn't that's mm. not the way I perceived it at the other end and you know there's all the various ways that we know to communicate by email by telephone now there's just so many different ways with the uh, Twitter and all sort of the new technologies yeah, that there are. yeah and, exactly mm. and we chat and everything there's mm. so many ways to communicate yeah. uh, and yet the the face-to-face -face is so important in the midst of all that and but it's not possible to do it all the time. Like for instance, in our organization where we have 172 countries and there are seven regions of the world that report into me as global CEO, you know, you can't have face-to-face -face conversations with these people all the time. But we try to make it better and I certainly think things like Skype uh, has helped. We've just introduced telepresence in the office in DC to make that experience a better experience mm. and that it looks more and more realistically like a face-to-face -face mm. conversation because I do think that's probably the best way but from an economic standpoint as well as everything else it's not possible to to do that all the time but the, the using all those forms of communication and you know as we were chatting earlier when you arrived the old ways of communicating are as good as the new ways of communicating so whether it is the newsletter or the written letter or I mean I, I send a Christmas card to every single one of my staff uh, and I think there must be over 200 in the organization and I write a personal note every year just acknowledging the work the positive things that happened in the year and you know wishing them well for the next year and I just think it's yeah it takes a bit of time sure it does but you know what everything takes a bit of time so you just have to set aside the time if you think it's important enough Absolutely. so that's what I say I think that is important enough now somebody else might dismiss that and say oh don't be ridiculous that's a waste of your time sending in a card out to everybody I would hazard a guess it lands way better and way more impactfully than a bottle of wine or a 50 euro one for all gift card yeah well i, I would hope i would hope that it would yeah. because first we couldn't afford the bottle of wine or the, or the or the 50 euro gift card for everybody in the organization we're not for profit so we couldn't afford that but it means way much it, means it way just more. means it's a personal touch mm. comes from me and i really do want to acknowledge their presence in the organization and what they've brought to the success and I think it's having people understand that no matter what role you play, you know, whether you, whether you work in finance, whether you work in administration, whether you work in legal, or whether you work coaching on the ground face to face with people, you play an important role. You know, I remember reading somewhere, uh, and you, you probably have seen this over time as well, uh, I think it was President Kennedy, God rest his soul, when he was in, um, when he went to visit NASA and he said, uh, he met the janitor and he said to the janitor, oh, well, what do you do around here? And he said, oh, I help people on the moon. Yeah. And just thought, yeah, well, good for you because that's what you do. Because yeah. if somebody didn't do that job, then yeah, you, the, they wouldn't be as successful yeah. as they are. So it's, it's understanding everybody's contribution to life. Agreed, and what NASA I think did very, very well, whether they did it on purpose or by accident, um, was they had their why very, very simply put out there and they communicated that to that staff very, very well. Mm. What's NASA's why? To put a man on the moon. Yeah. That's why we exist. Yeah. Um, and everybody knew that. Yeah. Um, and I suspect, you know, it's really interesting when you look at, when you look at, um, when you look at purpose for an organization and actually that's what gets people bought in. That's what mm. gets them emotionally bought into your organization. Yeah, and is. I guess you're lucky as the head of a non-profit because people choose to work there because they believe mm. in in many ways they believe in what you're trying to achieve as an organization mm. and that galvanizes them and the organization to a point where everybody is is forcefully they're not just going the same direction they are pushing the yeah. same direction and you've got all those people behind you all pushing for the same thing yeah. it must be phenomenal to be the head of 
but that's so powerful when yeah. you when you do get that and I mean you know it's 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 not always the case either you know of course you do get you know people that want to go different direction or whatever but generally speaking mm. when you can mobilize people to work together and actually that was the strength of 2003 the team that we had in 2003 the team of staff that were assembled the volunteers every single one of them and there were 30,003 including yourself in the yeah. badminton and Baldoy but every one of them knew that they were contributing to something bigger that was going to be massive yeah. not just for the country but for the world and that was going to do something that was magical in that it was going to change change lives of people change lives of ourselves I'm not just talking about people with intellectual disability no, all of us. because yes it was going to do that but it changed all of us mm. inside mm. of us mm. and that was that was a very powerful message for people and people understood that and therefore they were prepared to do whatever they had to do to ensure that the games were successful mm. And now I try to do that in the organization as well, all the time, just bring people along, get everybody mobilized towards the same goal, communicate as much as you, as you can in all the different ways of people, and empower them. Once people have the skills uh, and that you've done the training, which again, going back to 2003, is what we would have done with all the volunteers. Mm -hmm. We made sure they were well trained. Yeah. Then go and empower them. Mm -hmm. Don't try to be micromanaging them or looking over them. Trust, that's where the trust bit comes in. Trust them now to go out there and multiply and mm -hmm. do their job and get other people bought into the organization. And that's enabling them to be leaders and allowing them to, and that's where to me, when leadership cascades all the way down, that's when I would say you're a good leader. Yeah, I remember, I'm smiling because I remember, as you were talking there, an empowered uh, volunteer in the Badminton Centre, and you, you mentioned uh, Dennis O'Brien earlier on, and um, O'Brien Sandwiches were the, right. the, the food sponsor, if you remember, and they yeah. provided all the food yeah. for all the volunteers. Yeah, they did. And um, I remember uh, one of our, one of our more more elderly volunteers, Dennis O'Brien, came to visit the venue one afternoon, and uh, he he came in the door. Hi, Dennis. How are you? I was kind of showing him around, and and this volunteer came up and shook his hand and went, "Mr. O'Brien, thanks very much for the sandwiches." <laughs> <laughs> and we, I didn't heard that story. So we, actually. Yeah, so we just ushered her away. Very sorry, Dennis. Very sorry. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Don't be <laughs> Very, very good. Very good. Oh, Thanks that's for the sandwiches, Mr. That's Brian. great. <laughs> so let me ask you. Let me ask you one thing um, around change, because I think Special Olympics, like all organisations, go through change and, and have to go through change mm -hmm. to remain relevant um, and to remain, you know, relevant in a, in a changing landscape. What do you think the role of a leader is during times of change, and, and how can they support change to make it successful? Well, change is inevitable, I think, and change is good too. I mean, sure. it has to happen, but. It's for a lot of people. It's a four. It's four-letter word: fear. Mm. Fear, fear, fear. For some reason, people think that, you know, it's it's going to be worse rather than better when change happens. So it's it's trying to reduce that that fear in people, and it's a bit like what we spoke about earlier though it's 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 how you communicate with people and bring them along in the process of change that can that can influence them so i think it's it's about influencing and persuading people as well and bringing them along with you and they understanding well why do you want to change in the first place like why do we want to change something mm. you know is it is it broken is it that there's some new innovation now that we want to introduce into the movement or into the organization so so why are you doing it in the first place and then how how are the how is everybody that's going to be impacted going to be involved in the process and i think when you when you do that and bring people along all the steps the various steps and listen to them uh, it's easier to it's easier to i think to accept the change if you feel that you're part of it mm. yeah i agree i absolutely agree i think that once you get brought on the journey mm. and you feel part of that journey yeah and part of that change back to a point you made earlier about even if you don't agree with it mm -hmm. 
you've had your say, you've had your input, um, and now as a team we have to get on for it for the betterment for the betterment of ourselves and for the organisation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. No. Do, does everybody then always behave like that? No, no. not always. No. But then I always say there, there, there's there's always like you know people at either end of the spectrum, and then there's the people in the in the middle mm. who who will generally, and I think our job as well, or the job of leaders is to try and bring the people on the fringes in as much as you possibly can and get them in towards the middle, but. I think that you also have to accept in the reality that it's not always possible to bring everybody along. But at least I think if you can feel that you have really made the effort yeah. and, and tried to, um, then you, well for me it's all about my conscience actually as well. You know, I can feel, well look, I did the very I best tried. thing that I could do mm. in relation to that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Sure. Let me ask you, who some of your leadership role models are? Who who have you learned the most from from a leadership perspective? Who do you, who do you look up to? Well, Eunice, it's hard to avoid without saying Eunice Kennedy Shriver because really, I mean, you know what the woman did was just incredible. You know, when you think that she grew up in that powerful family and she had a sister with intellectual disability who nobody would talk about, and that she was brave enough and courageous enough to come forward and say Rosemary has an intellectual disability <coughs> excuse me when really it was never talked about mm. uh, and then to 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 go on and rally uh, her own brother who you know had become the president of the U United States and got him to change legislation and to then provided funding through the Kennedy Foundation to uh, to, to pay people to work in sport and recreation around the, the states and then to start the first games in 1968. Like she did all that ever before she started the, the games in, in Special Olympics in 1968. So a truly, you know, courageous, brave uh, woman that never, ever took no for an answer. Like it just doesn't exist, that word, in, in her vocabulary. It was, yes, we can make this, and yes, we can do this. And even, you know, when she came to Ireland, and she met, visited many, many times when I was, both when I was national director and when I was volunteering, and you had to be inspired by her. Mm. Because she always arrived, you know, to the airport, and she never even wanted to go to the hotel. She couldn't care less where she stayed never wanted to go um, in and be, you know, looked after with hospitality. Uh, she wanted to be on the field of play. Where were the athletes? Where were they competing? Where were they practicing? Where were they training? That's where she was and that's where she was happiest. And that influenced me definitely. Uh, and that's actually the way that I've tried to conduct my presence in Special Olympics as I've gone along in my career as well. Mm -hmm. So she was very inspirational. You know, I mean, yeah, there are, I suppose, lots of other people that you would look at and say, well, were they, were they good leaders? Were they poor leaders? Because you can have, you can have leaders that are not so good leaders. I don't think well. you learn from it. You learn from both. I think, yeah, I think, I you, think you do. Yeah, you probably, yeah. yeah, you do. You do learn from both. I had great experience with the people I worked with in 2003. I mentioned the board earlier, I mentioned Dennis, you have mentioned him in your funny story. Uh, but he he was a great leader. But Moya Doherty is another, I think, for me, a female role model, which is, you know, was uh, important. Um, and, you know, what she went on to do with, with her life and the way she did it, I think, was was fantastic. And you learn a great deal from people like that. She was also very involved with her husband, John Corrigan, with the opening ceremony of the Games. Yeah. Put an amazing show together. And working with those people was an incredible experience because mm. you're working with real, you know, people that have made such an impact mm. on the world stage, mm. really. Uh, so, yeah. All of those, I would say, would have had an influence on my life. My my own mother as well, and my mother-in-law. It's funny, I seem to be referring to women most yeah. of the time, but it is true. Uh, you know, my, my own mother was an amazing woman that grew, grew up like we were reared in rural Ireland. You know, didn't have a huge amount, um, but 
was steeped in, in community and in understanding the value of people and understanding the value of your neighbour. Yeah. And I think that was probably instilled in me from a very young age. You know, it takes a village to raise a child and it takes a village to get anything done. Mm. And it does. And we saw that in days when everybody gathered together and did all the work together. Mm. And now it's the same thing. I mean, I look at my organization like a village and it takes all of us in that village to make the great things happen that happen in the world of Special Olympics. Yeah, yeah, interesting, really interesting. Very finally now, um, very one last thing in 30 seconds. What leadership advice would you give to your 20-year-old self looking back over the 10 years or so? Well, I'd first of all say be yourself. Yeah. Be yourself. Because, you know, even when you're younger, you're a bit more tempestuous and you're less patient as well. I, I don't know if I go back to my own uh, career in the beginning. You know, you're, um, uh, you're less tolerant, I think. Well, well, I could talk about myself because you asked me. What I'm, fine, I'm finding, I'm finding that the other way around, actually. I'm finding I'm that as I get older, really? I'm less tolerant. No, I find yeah. I'm more tolerant, more tolerant, <laughs> definitely. More understanding, more tolerant. Um, and I wish, you know, it, it's like, you know, life, you have to live life forwards, but it would be fantastic to be able to live it backwards. There's, a, the, the, there's definitely a quote about that. Mm. Um, and... It is true, you know, I, I think you live your life forward, but if you could live it backwards, there's there's so much you'd have learned. Um, but unfortunately, we can't do that. We have to live it forwards and we learn by our mistakes. Yeah. And I feel that about myself. I feel, you know, I maybe could have been more tolerant in situations or with people even, that maybe I'd have got further with in particular situations that now I deal with in a totally different way. But maybe you have to go through these experiences to learn as well. Maybe that's the way it is. So I would say, say be, your, be yourself for starters. I think that's really important. And um, I think attitude is critically important and just what you do and how you do it and who you are as a person. And if you can live every day like that at the end of the day saying, well, am I happy with myself today? Because it is a little bit, it's that self actualization that Maslow talked about Definitely. and it's getting to that stage and uh, hopefully I'd like to think I'm coming close to it. <laughs> I think you're pretty close to it I have to say. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank um, you Scott. I've, I've pleasure really, really you it. and the very best of luck as well in everything that you're doing right now. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more on inspiring change and to read our blog please visit inspiringchange.ie.